Any questions about NMR, comprehensive spec problems, which will be on uh, each test? Okay, we have purple handout. Uh, did we finish up the yellow handout? Any questions about NAS or benzene reactions? Peroxides, bromine does what? I would just stick with light. The peroxides does the same thing. Okay. We have some light coming into the bond, and we get a heterolytic bond cleavage, and that gives what? Bromine has three lone pairs, right? How many lone pairs does the bromine have now, or what do we have now? And what? Yes, and one here. One of these electrons comes this way, one of these goes that way. Fish hook arrow, half hook arrow. Okay? So light will cause the bromine bond to homolytically cleave. 
And each, each bromine gets the same thing, one electron. How many days did we get? Instead of drawing the other one, can I just put a two here? Okay. At this point, this bromine radical will sort of strip an H out of here. This H is all over the place. Where's the best place to form a radical in this molecule? The benzylic carbon, the same place, the best place to form a carbocation. And this electron comes here and teams up with one of these electrons. The other electron stays on carbon. And what does that give? What's now on this carbon here? Radical. Plus what? What did we form? HBr. There is a there is an H remaining here, right? Yeah? I only forgot one. There's one there. What's the charge of this radical? Yes, neutral? Neutral? Yes? Um, what's next? How do we get our final product? The other bromine radical? That's actually not the exact mechanism because if you remember, we can turn the light off. I don't know if that's a light bulb. I don't know how to draw a light bulb. Yeah. Uh, the light bulb shining light into here. Uh, no, we don't want to use the next bromine radical because if we did, how would we, we would have no more bromine radicals, right? Instead, this reacts with another. Another bromine and one electron here teams up with one of these electrons and this electron moves here and what does that give? That gives final product plus what? Bromine radical. Plus we reform a bromine radical and that's considered propagation. We reform bromine, it's almost like reforming catalyst, but it's not, it's a stoichiometric bromine. But at this point, because we reform bromine radical, we can turn the light bulb off, and we, because the light only needs to generate bromine radicals at the very beginning. We turn the light off, and then this bromine radical does what? It comes back over here and acts as a bromine radical. Okay, so this comes and then reacts with another molecule. And it does this cycle, because when it reacts with another molecule, then we get a second bromine molecule uh, in, but we produce a bromine radical, and so we can keep cycling a gazillion times. And that's called propagation. Uh, now instead of, instead of bromine, we could have also have used NBS, and we could have did the same thing. If you use NBS, you produce an NH compound at the end instead of a BRH. We produced a BRH. If you use NBS, you, you produce an NH compound at the end called succinamide. Okay, so benzylic bromination is a common reaction. Uh, largely review the organic one. Uh, typically only bromine. 
Uh, fluorine and chlorine radicals are too reactive and thus they're uh, non-selective for the benzylic position. And you would, you would fluorinate or chlorinate at other positions. It turns out Mother, Nat Mother Nature gave us bromination, benzylic, I mean radical bromination to be very selective for the benzylic position. In terms of thermodynamics, rates, Iodine, you typically don't do radical iodination. Actually, with iodine, the reaction, reverse reaction is favored. A lot of iodine compounds, the iodine will come off and go back to having an H there. So in the end, we usually just do benzylic bromination. What's the reason? Well, once we get a bromine there, what can we do? Well, now we have a traditional leaving group for SN1, SN2, E1, E2. And we can react with something like KCN. And the product would be what? We can just do an SN2. Yeah. And we can make a cyanonitrile compound. Uh, if we react this with potassium terpetoxide, what, what reaction can we do here? What reaction, traditional reaction, does that look like? E2. Yes, E2. How do you recognize E2? Strong base. Not only is it strong base, it is sterically hindered strong base. Yes, traditional leaving group product here. What type of product are we going to make here? type of product we're going to make here? Alkene. Alkene, yes. Will the alkene be stereogenic? Yeah. So will it be cis or trans? Trans. Why trans? Hmm? Why is it preferred here? Okay, so you're saying we always get trans? No. Why do we get trans here? Are you saying you always get trans from an E2 elimination? Are you saying we always get trans from an E2 elimination? So how do you decide if you get cis or trans? Because if you tell me that trans has groups opposite, then, then why would you not always get trans? Trans is more thermodynamically stable product. What's the uh, stereochemical requirement for E2 elimination? Your hydrogen that you're taking has to be anticoplanar to your leaving group. Yes, yes. The H has to be the anticoplanar to, yes? No? Okay. Is it going to matter here? When does that really matter? Whenever. Well, that requirement is always there, but it's only going to, to be relevant or dictate the outcome when. In your rings. How many different beta hydrogens here? One, two, three. There's two there. Depends on what you mean by one. There's only one beta hydrogen site. How many? How many are H's are there? There. Two. Two. So does the serochemical requirement matter? Why not? Because you can take either one. Yes. Okay. This is all organic one review, right? Okay. 
All right, I'll just draw the product. My only fear is that if if there was a if it, if it was going to be cis, would you know when it was going to be cis? Or, and I hope you just wouldn't draw trans all the time. But in this case, it would be trans. So we could have just took the answer of trans and went with it, but then some other question comes up where it could, would be cis. Do you know how to recognize that? Yes, it would be trans here because there's two beta hydrogens, and since there's two, you have a choice. And since there's a choice, it's all organic one, right? Okay, so an E2 of emanation, SN2, okay. So doing a benzylic bromination, we can then do other chemistry. And now we can do alkene chemistry if we want. We can do chemistry with a cyano group, which we'll learn during test three material. And a way to make cyano compounds or nitriles is shown right here. Multi-step synthesis. Can you show a product of this? Anybody got a product of this reaction down here? Multi-step synthesis will be on the uh, test. How are we doing with multi-step synthesis? Did anybody get a product of this one? Okay, let's look at the next reaction. Uh, benzylic oxidation. Benzylic oxidation. Uh, we've not seen this before, brand new here. Uh, a benzylic carbon can be oxidized. You take tyrene and you heat it with KMnO4, which is one of the big three oxidants. Remember the big three? Any of the big three work and we can convert the benzylic carbon to a carboxylic acid. Okay? This is probably a radical oxygenation. One requirement, this requires a benzylic hydrogen. Requires a benzylic. And basically, it's probably a multiple radical oxygenation, and it's probably an intermediate is carbon, and replace all H's, not with bromines, but with OH's. This may be the intermediate, but then this is going to lose water. It will lose water to give the carboxylic acid. Uh, this losing water, we'll look at that type of mechanism during test four. Carbonyl chemistry. This will lose water to form a carbonyl. Okay? Pretty straightforward, basic, you just have not seen it before. Okay? Now we're not going to look at the mechanism of this reaction. I told you as much as we kind of know or usually see, probably a radical oxygenation, complete radical oxygenation. Previous page when we brominated the benzylic carbon, we only did one bromination. You can do two or three if you use excess reagent. Here we're just oxygenating three times. Okay. But there's more to it. Because if you take a longer alkyl chain with KMnO4, you'll also get the carboxylic acid. In this case, we have cleaved two carbons. Okay? Carbon carbon bind cleavage. We're actually cleaving one at a time. Fate of the carbons is CO2. So 
So if you want to balance this, how many CO2s would be formed? Two. Yes. Okay. Does this compound contain a benzylic hydrogen? Does this carbon contain a benzylic hydrogen? Yes? Okay. So it meets the requirement. And we will get this off. It'll chew off the other two carbons as carbon dioxide. Again, not really looking the mechanism here. So it's oxidative cleavage. Uh, what's the product of this reaction down here if we take this compound with KMnO4? And KMnO4 is the most common when we do benzoic oxidation. You can theoretically do it with sodium dichromate or chromium trioxide. KMnO4 is the most common. Product down here. Is anything going to happen to this tert-butyl group? No. Does the carbon have a benzylic hydrogen? No. no. Nothing happens to it. What about this ethyl group? Does it have a benzylic hydrogen? What's going to happen to it? It will become a carboxylic acid. One of these carbons will get chewed off. This can be, a, this can be 20 carbons long. 19 of them will get chewed off and you'll be left with a carboxylic acid. Kind of a wild and crazy reaction mechanism. We're not looking at the precise details. Question? If both of them have a benzoic hydrogen, would it do it at both places? Yes. Okay. Why is benzene highly toxic, but toluene not? Or it's less toxic. I mean, I wouldn't say it's not toxic. Tylene is less toxic because it has this benzylic carbon. And guess what the body does to it? It oxidizes it. The body is a crazy chemist. Lots of oxidations. Okay? Now, your body doesn't use KMnO4. Your body uses enzymes, oxygen. But it can accomplish the similar chemistry. And once it becomes a benzoic acid, much more water soluble. And in the right conditions, it can be in the ionic form, anion. And that would make it even more water soluble. Water soluble molecules are more easily flushed out in the aqueous system. Okay. Benzene gets in your body and it hides in the fatty tissue. And when the aqueous blood comes along, it just it doesn't like that. Bit. I don't like it. But it hides and it accumulates and then it starts causing problems. Okay? All right? Basically, when, you, uh, when you're washing your dishes, you know, or any, anything, I want to, you know, if you had sand and sugar, which one's going to be washed out more with easily with water? Sugar will dissolve. The sand, there's something that water just won't dissolve and it'll just kind of stay there. Sugar's more soluble. Okay? The benzoic acid is more soluble. It's going to be washed out and it's not, so it's not going to build up and cause problems. At least that's one of the one reasons why. Uh, this is called a metabolic handle. This molecule has a metabolic handle. The body can do something with it. Okay, can you give a multi-step synthesis of that compound from benzene? <coughs> what do we know how to make? We have a new reaction for our toolbox. We know how to make benzoic acids from what type of group? From an alkyl group, yeah? Make this from benzene. Retrosynthesis. Let's go backwards. If we were to, let's take one of these groups off. Let's take off the carboxylic acid. 
Go back to nitrobenzene. If you had nitrobenzene, could you make this? Why could you not make that? Because you need a... I know two reasons. The first is hopefully what... You would need a, a carbon with benzylic H's by the benzylic oxidation. You don't have a substituent. Okay, I reckon that's the second of the reason. Do you know a reaction to put a carboxylic on directly? Mm -hmm. Not yet, you will later. <laughs> okay. But there's another reason. So what if we could put something here? Is it going to go there? What type of director is this? It's a metal director. We need something pair to that. Right? That's a metal director. So we don't want to go back to that. What if we go back to Benzoic acid. If you had benzoic acid, could you nitrate it? We know how to nitrate things. Mm -hmm. But that would be a meta director. Too. Also a meta director. Can we not make this compound from benzene? How can we do this? Can we do a it back We need a pair director. Or to a pair director. Take it back to what? To where it has a metal or a metal attached. How about an ortho para precursor? Do you know a precursor to any, either one of these groups? Yeah, but how are we going to turn the NH2 back to an NO2? We got to end with an NO2. Yes, the NH2 is an ortho pair director. But if this was NH2, how would you convert it to NO2? And that's a hard reaction that you don't know. We only know the other way. So that is a that's not a precursor to a nitro. It's a it's a after the nitro. I mean come from nitro. What does a carboxylic acid come from? Okay, and what type of director would that be? What we need is, we really need to go back to a precursor. That is, what instead we went back to an ethyl. What type of director is this? Ortho pair? Now let's come forward. What would you do here first? Would you oxidize this to the carboxylic acid first? No. No. Because that would give this, but then that's a metal director. What do we need to do first here? We need to nitrate. We need to nitrate. How do you want to nitrate? Nitric acid and sulfuric acid, that would give what? That would give this plus ortho. Now on paper, on multi-step synthesis, we can just, okay, look at the pair. That's what we want. It may not be great yield, but this is the one we are looking to make. Then what do we need to do here to get the final product? Now we oxidize it. Would that give do these two reactions look good? Mm -hmm. Okay. How do you want to make this? Can we make this from benzene? Because if we can make this from benzene, then we're done. 
How are you going to make this? And I put a two carbon here on purpose. Benzene. And I'll do it all, all one. There's a, first thing I would do would be, how about this acid chloride and aluminum trichloride? What is that, a Friedel Crafts acylation? Do I need to draw this out? Why don't we draw that out? What does that do? I hope everybody can see. Mm -hmm. Here, these pens are a little light. Everybody can see the thing? Yeah. If not, please yell. You get the ketone, right? Mm -hmm. Could we just use an ethyl chloride and aluminum chloride rather than having to do ketones? Okay, and now, more reactions? thanks for the question. So, you want to do a Friedel Crafts alkylation? Yes. Yes. Yes, I do. <laughs> and doesn't a Friedel Krauss alkylation have problems? Oh, it does. That's right. And didn't we, we said it all together three times. What did we say? Right. A week ago. Acylation, then reduction. Didn't we say that three times? We did. <laughs> Acylation, then reduction. Say it three times. Acylation, then reduction. Acylation then reduction is much better than direct alkylation. So I'm going to do an acylation first, and then I'm going to do a reduction. And that is how what what we had three ways to do the reduction. What what was your favorite way? What's the most common textbook way? Everybody made note cards of all your reactions? Keep a catalog of your reaction toolbox. How do you re remove the oxygen? There are three ways. Hydrogenation, Clemenson reduction, wolf kishner reduction. Right? Clemenson reduction is what? Zinc mixed with what? With mercury and ACL. Clemenson reduction. Okay. Acylation followed by reduction. Then do the nitration with orthopera. Well, that's a meta director there. That is a precursor along the way. We needed a meta, meta director. But we also have a meta director here that we could convert this to. But we need an orthopera director. So it's at this point that we need to do the nitration. And after we do the nitration, then we can oxidize and get our final product. So sequencing. Sometimes we need to look for a precursor that has different directing effects. Right? Both of these are meta directors. We need a precursor that is an orthopera director. MGBR? Uh, there may be another way to make the ethyl. The most common way is, is to isolate Friedel Crafts isolation by reduction. But you want to do a. Would that be wrong to like bring yours? You want to do a. Uh, well, tell, tell me. I'm thinking. Just clarify. What, what are you talking about? No, you, no, that, there's no reaction there. What, I, what reaction do you think is going to happen there? Because then that would be a um, methyl with a um, one there to attack. No, uh, Grignard doesn't react with a benzene ring. Mm -hmm. We've never reacted to Grignard, Grignard with a benzene ring. I thought you were talking about maybe a benzene approach. Possibly do that, but but not reacting to Grignard, but just depending on Okay, in the 
back of this handout, there are some other, there's two pages, two pages. There will be multi-step synthesis on the test. And there's two pages back here. Okay. Oh, we gotta get two groups on the ring. And they're both ortho pair directors. Is there a precursor to one of these that maybe is a meta director? What's a precursor to an ethyl? Meta director? Mm -hmm. Uh, next one, amino and iota. Those are both ortho pair directors. How do you get this meta relationship? Is there a precursor to one of those? What's a precursor to one of those? Nitro is a precursor to an amino, and a nitro is a meta director. So when you have a nitro, that maybe that's when you do a, an EAS reaction. Yeah. Okay. There's some there for practice. Um, let's look at the diazonium reaction, sometimes called Sandmeyer reaction. Uh, this is not a benzylic carbon, and it's really not called benzylic, but we're looking at something bonded to the ring, in this case an amino group. There's a very uh, common reaction you can do with anions, shown here, diazonium chemistry. We can convert the anion to a diazonium ion. Di meaning two, aza meaning nitrogen. This here, nitrogen is positive. Got a seat, got a, going to have a minus with it. This can be done with nitrite. Is that nitrite? What is it in 2 Sodium nitrite. In 3 would be sodium nitrate. Yes, we're using sodium nitrite. And some type of acid, okay? This is just H+. Doesn't have to be Cl. But if it's Cl, you're going to have Cl minus here with your diazonium. We'll look at this mechanism most likely, yes. But the diazonium acts as a leaving group. It can be replaced with many other things. So ultimately, this can be replaced with many other things by first converting it to the diazonium. Uh, let's look at these. First off, these two. If you use copper chloride or copper bromide, copper 1, you can replace the diazonium with the Cl or Br. And this is benzene Cl, benzene Br, chlorobenzene, bromobenzene. This is probably a radical reaction. That's probably why copper is required. It doesn't work with just like sodium bromide or potassium bromide. We need to transition metal and copper is most common. We're not looking at mechanism here. This is probably radical reactions. And usually and when you use the copper, that's when it's really called Sandmeyer reaction. A lot of times any of these are called Sandmeyer reactions which we also just call it diazonium chemistry. Now with iodine, you don't need the copper. You can use just like sodium or potassium iodide. That's because iodide itself is redox active, where the other halogens are not as redox active. And guess what we're doing in lab this week? We're doing a diazonium, and you're using potassium iodide, and you're going to generate the iodofluorine by the way, what's the fate of the two nitrogens here? 
In every case, we get nitrogen gas. Okay, into gas. And you can actually see bubbles forming in your reaction, which is the nitrogen gas. You can also get a fluorine on the ring. And remember, we did not do a direct fluorination. And I told you that a better way to put a fluorine on the ring is a diazonium reaction. Now with fluorine, the method is, it's a little bit different. It requires high temperature and because of practical things, it's done this way. We take the original diazonium and we, act it, we react it with tetrafluoroboric acid. And this replaces the whatever anion you have here with a BF4 minus anion. Okay? Or boron with four Fs around it. What's the charge of the boron? It's minus. Okay? You should see that. You should have been able to do that the first week of organic one. You have a periodic table. Alright? That minus and the diazonium together is your salt. And that is always a precipitate. Okay? Now you gotta be careful. Diazoniums can be explosive. Alright? Because this is rarely really wanting to give off nitrogen, okay? And if you're not careful, so usually you don't isolate the diazonium. But in this case, you do, because it precipitates, all right? This thing precipitates, and you filter it off. You've got to be careful. It can be explosive. <laughs> but then you explode it. You heat it but you do it very controlled, and you stand back, and you have safety precautions and a safety shield. But when you explode it, heat it, it will give, one of these Fs will become bonded. Okay, mechanism we're not looking at, it's more of a practical thing. But this is a way that developed over the years to get a fluorine on the ring better than direct fluorination, if you believe. Because direct fluorination is even more potentially hazardous. All right? Uh, F2 is just a very dangerous molecule, very reactive. Okay? I actually knew a, knew a chemist that used to be at Clemson who worked with fluorine all of his career, and he's missing a half an arm. <laughs> and two or three fingers on the other hand. All right? Uh, that's because when he was in graduate school at like University of Washington in the early 1960s, he was, uh, there was a, an explosion with some fluorine, and he was severely injured. Uh, but he continued on as a chemist. Um, With like three fingers? How do you do stuff? I, well, one arm, is, one arm is missing. I don't know right. if it's like here or the shoulder. The, the other one is, is missing. I can't remember if it's two over here or two over here or something. But um, Maybe it's only one, but there's, there's something up on the other hand. Basically, he was probably like this when it blew up. and uh, right. um, He didn't have any damage to it. Uh, I had lunch with him like one, one time and he told me a story that uh, they had, back then they had a tank of flooring out in the outside. You know like uh, today we have like gas propane tanks or something, but back then they had a, a tank of flooring outside the lab on, just in the, on the lawn. And he said one day uh, there was all these bees around the tank. And he said the tank was leaking flooring very small amount, and apparently it, fluorine has a little sweet scent to it, and it was attracting the bees. I don't know if they were just coming around and just dying or what, but he said that his, his, his director or whatever, lab boss or whatever, 
sent him out there with a wrench to tighten the thing. And he said that the bolt that he was tightening was like glowing red because it was leaking, you know. And, and, you know this is what they did. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, this is, imagine when flooring was first discovered uh, 60 years earlier. You know, it's like, how do you control this thing? All right. And anyway, you got to be careful. And one of the scariest I've ever been in lab is doing a diazonium reaction. You can do many other reactions here, and I was, we were trying to convert this and have a sulfur here. Benzene with an SH group, a thiophenol. And we took our amine, it was not aniline, it was some other amine, made the diazonium, and this was in a flask about the size of a volleyball. Okay, not a flask like this, but more of a flask like this. Big, big, okay. Uh, we dripped it in. Then we started dripping in the reagent, one of these reagents to do the reaction and dripping it in from the addition funnel. And it was dripping in. All of a sudden it went BAM! Real loud, like a, like a go kart backfire or a lawnmower. <laughs> ever heard such? Anybody ever go outside? Okay. It's like. Okay. And I was working, I had, it was a first year student. You know, I was like, fourth year. And um, so I took off running. <laughs> and I told him to stop it. <laughs> okay. And I got around the corner and I heard it do it again. It went BAM! Oh gosh. And, um, uh, and so we stopped it and we added some water and kind of diluted it. And um, then about a year later I read that uh, diazonium sulfides are particularly explosive. And I'm like, yeah, I think I know that. I should have did my pre-lab research ahead of time. Okay. We should not have been doing it on such a big uh, scale the first time. Also, perhaps because the neck of the flask was so narrow and there a lot of gas was coming out that it just was a, I don't know, maybe a more open flask that was needed. Um, maybe better stirring was needed. Okay. In any event, uh, sometimes the first time you do something, you don't do it quite right. And so maybe the fifth or sixth time you get it right. Uh, but you got to be careful when there's potential hazard. In any event, if you take your diazonium and just heat it with water, now it's going to be acidic because this is acidic. You can make a phenol and replace the diazonium with an OH. And that's a great way to make a phenol, which we've not seen any other way to make a phenol. If you heat your diazonium with this acid, you can make benzene. <laughs> now who's making benzene this way? Let's take benzene and, and nitrate it and reduce it and make a diazonium and, take, and convert it back to benzene. Nobody's doing that. But there are some times where you may want to remove an amino group. And you have essentially done that because you've replaced it with an H. We're, out of t we're almost out of time. I think we've got a minute here. What's the name of that? H3PO4 is phosphoric acid. H3PO3 is phosphorus acid. What is H3PO2? Hypophosphorus acid. It also goes by the name of phosphenic acid. You can look it up. Just type that in Google and you'll get a hit. We can also make nitriles this way. Like the copper chloride and bromide, if you do copper cyanide, you can replace the diazonium with a cyano group. Another way to make it. That's going to be a nitrile on the ring. Benzonitrile. Diazonium chemistry. Very versatile because we can make lots of things on our ring in place of the amine. You can use this in your multi-step synthesis. So basically, we now have a precursor to lots of groups via a diazonium, two-step approach. We'll look at this mechanism on Monday. Please be doing some multi-step synthesis, but that will be on the test. And uh, we may have a quiz on Monday. Uh, 
We've got test day coming up, guys. Have a good weekend. See some of you in lab. Good afternoon.